Yes. Um, age that did not happen while I was at Wiregrass Church has gotten the better of me. So I need my glasses. And I'm hopefully, um, and what's great is I can read this, but all of y'all are blurry. So you can be scowling at me and I won't, I won't know the difference. Um, if you're familiar with Wiregrass Church, it was, it's a non-denominational church. And I, I grew up hitting about every denomination you can think of um, in, with my, in my childhood, except for uh, Episcopalian. And over the past year or so, especially with the Wednesday Eucharist service, uh, we make it the 8 o'clock service here some. We're really in enjoying uh, the Episcopal Church. You guys are awesome and been very welcoming to my wife and I. Our children were able to come some over the holidays and to the point where my son is now going to the Episcopal Church in Tuscaloosa after visiting here. So great job everybody with that. Um, but you know if you're familiar at all with Wiregrass Church, um, we showed a lot of our sermons on video and so I was the pastor of a church that showed video and if you wonder why I will probably confirm that of today why we did that. So you, they didn't have to hear me was essentially part of the reason behind that. I, and that's somewhat of a joke, but not really. But um, so anyway, um, bear with me. I'm a little rusty. It's been a while since I've uh, been in the uh, behind the podium, so to speak. But um, and so to get us out, I like to uh, confirm everyone's worst fears about non denominational churches. And we're going to have a sing along. You ready? You better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sakes. You can stop. All right, there we go. We had to get to that line, being good for goodness sakes. And I don't know um, where you were, but from my childhood, I was a good boy. I did all the right things all the way through college. Um, I'm, you know, um, as a parent now, I would say, looking back on my time there, I made wise choices. I didn't misbehave, get in trouble. I mean, I did, you know, some basic mischievous stuff. But, but for the most part, I was a good kid. That really carried me all the way through. And I wish I could say that that was out of my awareness of my uh, compassion and passion for my relationship with God that I was so grateful that He loved me. Therefore, I was just, you know, that that goodness came out of that. No, I, I was fearful of getting in trouble, right? My goodness came strictly, it was circumstantial. It had nothing to do with my condition as someone who was loved and forgiven by God. And really, I didn't really understand what a faith looked like until I was in my teen years. You just kind of obeyed as a child and that made you good, um, so to speak. And you, you may have been that way. You may, um, maybe you weren't the most angelic kid. I know some of you, so I know that that's true um, for some of you. <clears throat> but oftentimes, don't we do good things transactionally? Oftentimes we, we uh, gosh, I'll do this good thing hoping that something comes back to me. Uh, Taylor Swift calls this thing her boyfriend, right? What is it, Meredith? Karma, yes, I got a Swifty over here. Um, I too am a Swifty. But yes, we think about karma. We want to do good things so that good things will come back to us. Um, we want to earn our relationships. We want to earn praise so we do good. But a lot of the good that we do is transactional. And we all do that. That we participate in the social transactions. We serve for the reward. And, and not everyone, sometimes we do it for the sake of doing good. And, and that's a good thing. But at the end of the day, like the song says, we want to make Santa's list. We, we want the loot. We want Christmas morning to be awesome. Whatever that Christmas morning is to you. So as we look at this, we're going to look at it, this idea of why be good. And, and good is just another way of saying being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Good in its purest form, good in its most, um, uh, what I would say, most biblically defined term is to do good, is to do good, to do the work of the Father. That is what the good works are. So we're going to look at God and the evangelical church or God versus the evangelical church um, towards the end. But to start us out, um, we're looking at what is grace. 
And Randy in his uh, email that I now get, thank you Randy uh, for that, uh, in his talk we're looking at being the hands and feet of Christ, but why is it necessary if we, um, we're good to go? In the evangelical world we would say we have our fire insurance. We know we're going to heaven, right? Because of God's grace. We have right standing with our Heavenly Father because of God's grace. So if it's all good, why be good? If being good is not part of the equation, because it's all good with God, then why do that? Grace is the unmerited favor of God. Unmerited means you can do nothing to earn it. If there's anything in the equation that is of us, then there's merit involved, right? So the unmerited favor is what the, how we define, or how I will define God's grace today. And then we have good works, which are being the hands and feet of Jesus. I'm not talking about um, you know doing a doing a good job cleaning the house. Although I think you could argue there's merit and good things in that. But I'm talking about being the hands and feet of Jesus, serving the oppressed, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. What does that look like? Being a friend to those who don't have friends, loving the unlovable. All of those things. Being the hands and feet of Jesus. That's what we're looking at when we look at good works and how these relate to each other. Is it the stimulus or is it the response? Do we do good works because we're stimulated by the recognition of God's grace? Or do we earn God's grace because we've done good works? Which if you define grace as the unmerited favor, then you would be talking against your own logic to say that. Yet, as we'll see later, many I think, do that. So it begs us to the ultimate topic of this Lenten series, why do good works? Why do good if it's just all good with God? And I'll be honest, I struggle with that myself. Because if we know we're in right standing with God, then the motivation, for me at least, is diminished when I look at it inwardly. When I look at it through my own lens. But when we look at it and we see what God has to say about it, things change. John 14, 15, and, and this is, I'm a seminary graduate, pastor for 20 years. I stink at like remembering Bible verses and the address. So I have to write them down. And this was an easy one, but I still had to look it up. Now, where's that again? But Jesus, in John 14, chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. So the first argument that I'm going to make for doing good works is just strictly the argument of obedience. The call of being obedient to our Heavenly Father. It's simply a matter of to enter into this relationship of grace, the unmerited favor. We're acknowledging that we can't do something on our own. That He had to do it for us. Raise your hand if you've ever heard Jesus referred to as our Savior. God sent a Savior. Why did He send a Savior? Because we needed saving. Lifeguards don't randomly jump in the pool when no one's drowning. Right? They only go into action if there is the need. God sent a Savior because we needed saving. It's really an act of surrender also to God's will. His commandments are to love. The whole Old Testament just threw out, and I forget the number, Randy, you're smarter than me. How many commandments are there? A lot. A lot, yeah. I put it in the billions, <laughs> somewhere just south of 80 billion commandments, somewhere between one and that. Anyway, there's, it's in the hundreds, the amount of, of commandments. We think of the 10 commandments, right? Oh, goodness, there's so many more. Somebody in here knows the answer to that. You're being humble. But it's like 600 and something, I believe. 613, thank you, Joe. Presbyterians, they got it down. <laughs> That's right. And what's great about Joe as a Presbyterian, he already knew I was going to ask that question, so he studied ahead. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. I'll be here all night. Not really. But anyway, so 613 commandments. And Jesus, when pressured, doing the things that Jesus always did, he summed it all up and said, yeah, yeah, you're trying to throw all this stuff at me. Here's what you need to know. Love God. 
Love others. 613. Love God, love others. That is being obedient to our Heavenly Father. It's not getting caught in the minutia. It's just simply loving God and loving others. This call to obedience is, from my standpoint, the first of three reasons why we should be in doing good works, being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. It's just simply a matter of obedience. If, we're, if He is our Lord, that is the relationship. The second one is this, and this is probably my favorite in terms of the um, amazingness of it at the end of the day. And that is when man and woman were created in Genesis. He says, God says, I'm making them in my own image. We are made in the image of God. Right? We are made in the image of God. We take on that which is the image of God. What is God? Who is God? God is love. And so for us to fulfill the role for which we were created is to be a reflector or an imager of God Himself. Being a reflector of God's love to the world around us. We get that opportunity. The first one, obedience, is something that we should do. I think being an imager or a reflector is something that we get to do. When we do good works, we are reflecting the image of God to the world around us. We get that opportunity. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got the pollen cough. Anybody else there with that? It's hit me pretty good. We get to be Christ-like in our actions. Jesus modeled the ultimate love through the death, burial, and resurrection. He took on human form. He came here. And if we're going to be modelers, imagers, reflectors of God, we get the opportunity to die to ourselves for the good and sake of others. We get the opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. That, in and of itself is the most compelling reason to me. Because it's not something I necessarily have to do. I, I'm, I'm Alabamian enough. I don't like anybody telling me what to do, the obedience thing. I'll do it, but I got a hard noggin. But the, the, the thought of getting to be an imager or reflector is very powerful. The third thing I think that compels us to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ is another opportunity. And this is something that, even though it is something that Jesus probably talked about as much or more than anything else, I think it is, and we talk about it on Sundays, in here and in every church in this community. But I never really have thought about it that much until the past couple of years. And I, are any English teachers, because I'm about to butcher the English language, I think, I'm not sure. <laughs> we get the opportunity to be kingdom usherers. Is that a word? Usher urge. We'll call it. Thank you. We get the opportunity to be ushers of the kingdom of God. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he talks about it all the time. Specifically, I think it's Matthew chapter 13. He goes through all the parable of the seeds and he goes through all these, these different stories. But he talks one where he talks about the, the seed falls on good soil and then it produces fruit or rocky soil and it's trampled. You guys know the, uh, the, the parable. And then Jesus, um, the disciples come to him and say, explain that to us, right? And I'm going to put it in Dothan terms. Jesus says, the, the, the seed that fell on the rocky soil, those were just no good. Bad. Auburn fans, if you will. You know what I'm saying? I mean, <laughs> just the bad soil, right? I'm kidding. But he says, those who see it falls on the good soil, the good soil soil. And he goes on and he talks about what makes up the good soil. And just this idea of, of um, how when it's in the good soil, it produces fruit. And we all know what the fruits of the Spirit are. What's the first one? Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Those are the fruits that is, when Jesus is trying to describe to us what the kingdom of God is, He said it is full of people who are exhibiting 
the good fruit because they're in the good soil. That is an analogy, a picture that Jesus gives us of the kingdom of God. So we get to be ushers of the kingdom of God into this world. So we get obedience, which is very important. Right? If He is our Lord, there is an obedience. There's a subjective factor to that. One of my favorite things, and I'm still learning about the Episcopal service, but I love before um, the altar, am I getting that right? The altar is approached, the kneeling and the bowing. There's a reverence. There's a power in that. Right? There's, there's a, there, it's just a magical thing. And then this idea of getting to be an imager or reflector back to the world around us of the love that we've received. We get to, to reflect that love back to our community through doing good works. And then the opportunity to be kingdom ushers. See, the kingdom of God is, is here. And Jesus says it is finished when He was on the cross. And if we try to add to that, you don't add something that's finished. It's done. Anything we add is pointless. And that's the beauty of the fullness of God's grace. And we get to reflect the love of that story and of that kingdom to the world around us. So that's why I think we should do good works. Obedience, reflection, kingdom. Now, how has that looked or how has that um, been handled, if you will, or taught or processed in the evangelical church? Um, I will say both good and bad. And I've probably been a participant and an instigator of both over the years. First, I want to say the evangelical church, if you're just not familiar with it, the theology is exactly what we've just talked about. The theology is hard, you know, straight on, grace, unmerited favor. That is the means of righteousness, right standing, salvation, whatever the word you want to use there is. However, that the position and the practice sometimes differ. And you guys may have been a part of other denominations growing up. You may have experienced this. But there is the belief in grace as the means to salvation. There is also the abuse of the grace works tension because of the human dynamic, the human dilemma. You see, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, when they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it was a position, and they were tempted with control. You can be like God. Our, our, he, he knew what the temptation would be. It is this idea that we know better than God, which, in my opinion, is just the, really the root of all sin, our deal over His deal at the end of the day. Then that manifests itself in a thousand different directions. But this idea that we want control... It is in everyone. We all want to have one of the worst feelings in the world is feeling out of control. We want to be in control. If you've ever been in a car and it's hydroplaned, that is the most, <laughs> I mean, I've, it's just helpless feeling in the world, being completely and utterly out of control. We all crave it, and I think there has been some leadership in the evangelical church that has taken advantage and leveraged that. This human nature of earning creeps into the relationship. It creeps into the relationship. And when you start thinking that your standing with God has anything to do with your own merit, it diminishes the work of Christ. And that power that people want to have can be leveraged. That empowering um, factor can hit the leadership, and it has hit the leadership of the evangelical church. And at least potential, no, no, this is not comprehensive. There are amazing, great evangelical churches. This is just some that has happened that I've observed. There's that potential for manipulation. You see, when you go somewhere and they're telling you how to behave in order to have a good standing with God, then you become dependent on that organization for the procedure manual. Your relationship with Jesus moves from His unmerited favor to a certain rules and regulations of the primary institution. 
Now, I don't think that that even happens intentionally sometimes, but it happens. And the second thing that can happen with that, and this is where you really see it in some of the country churches I grew up in, is guilt. Right? Now, Southern mothers have been leveraging guilt for years, and they're amazing at it. Churches can do the same thing. They can absolutely, they can manipulate giving. They can manipulate serving, reference, involvement, whatever the case may be, because they take the transactional, um, or they take the, the grace relationship with Jesus, and they can make it a transactional relationship. And if you're the person who's controlling the procedure manual, and you're the person who's controlling the rules, then you can manipulate, and you can mislead, and you can get people to do just about anything you want them to do. So I think that has been something that the evangelical church has struggled with. And the reason why I think the evangelical church has struggled with it, because primarily most evangelical churches are in the West, for the most part. Right? And we as Americans, we love to pull up our bootstraps and, you know, I, I get it because I earn it. We want to be in control. We want our freedoms. We want all these things. And for a society in the world, I think those are probably kind of good things. As a basis for a relationship with our Heavenly Father, we are all in trouble. Right? I want to end that portion by saying the evangelical church, for the most part, has done amazing things, done good things. Um, am I still all in on it? Probably to be determined. Because I think this is an issue that it's having to wrestle. And to be honest, I think every Christian, I think every church, on some level, wrestles with this tension of feeling like what I do can enter into making my relationship with God a thing or not a thing. But that to do that, to add to what Jesus said was finished, would be adding to grace and just like multiplying by zero. You just can't do it. That was for all my mathematicians in here. So God's work, I mean, doing the work, being the hands and feet of Christ are important. But it's the stimulus response. It should come out of our relationship, out of our condition not as a method or a means to an end. And that's why I think through obedience, through reflecting, and through ushering in the kingdom, we get to do good works. We don't have to do them. And boy, day, that's a big thing. All right, so we started out with a Christmas song, right? A good old Santa Claus one. We're going to end with one as well. And then, Randy, I'll, I'll be done. But... <laughs> It's the fifth verse of Joy to the World. <laughs> I'll read them to you. You'll play along. I'm going to read it first. It says, He rules the world. What does that imply? If He's ruling the world, then there is a kingdom. That's right. There is a kingdom. Kingdoms have rulers. His kingdom is here. We can celebrate that. We can live that. He rules the world with truth and grace. And grace. And gives to nations proof. I can't mean in, in Hueytown growing up, the Golden Gophers from my friends from Minnesota over there, you know, it was like, hey, y'all, watch this. He gives to nations proof the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. love. It is a kingdom of love. He is a God of love. And we are to be the hands and feet of Jesus because we are obedient to that love. We reflect that love. And we're ushering in the kingdom of that love. And it repeats it in wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. So, he rules the world with truth and grace and gives to nations proof. The glories of His righteousness. You got it from here. And wonders of His love. And wonders of His love. Everybody. Wonders of His love.